Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani, the Total Connector. I've been waiting for this talk for a pretty much a long time, and uh, I really wanted to connect Jeff Booth, the author of The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future, with Titus Gable, uh, Free Private Cities, which I read originally yeah, because it's in originally was in a German language. So after I read both books, I had a really enlightening moment. I knew exactly the vision. I mean, just imagine free private cities, deflation, deflationary technologies and economics, and rooted all that, you know, with uh, zero to one technology and, and Bitcoin, the hearts and scars is money, right? And yeah, this is all about freedom. And, and so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Hope you find this uh, as much as exciting as I do. Please like it, share, retweet it, whatever you do. It really helps, you know, also educate other people and inspire other people, educate other people. So let me know what you think and uh, give it a like, subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. And here you go. Without further ado, this is our talk co-hosted by Stephanie von Jan uh, with Jeff Booth and Titus Gable. And Titus, is that your real background right now? No, okay. that, is, that, is, that is where I live. That is Monaco. Okay, I and thought now, so. Only yeah. I'm sitting in my office and <laughs> now the re I'm basically about now I'm 30 minutes away from Monaco uh, in our house in Italy. And that's the reason why the internet is not so good. That's it. Okay. Right. Got it. Okay. Welcome to the show. Uh, my sp two special guests are Jeff Booth and Titus Gable. Um, in the order that I read the books, uh, firstly, I read the book of Jeff Booth. Uh, it's called Price of Tomorrow with the subtitle, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. And uh, the second book I read another, I mean, it's really my, my favorite books right now because, uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, the book of Titus Gable is called Free Private Cities. And um, once I read the, both books, I, I really had a vision, to be honest with you. Now, first of all, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to the show, Jeff and Titus. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you also to my co-host, co-moderator, <laughs> Stephanie, who is an economist, lectures uh, economy at German universities and writes excellent articles on Bitcoin and central banking system and the creation of money. Let me start off with, um, uh, giving a short introduction, maybe a, uh, about uh, our our both both of our special guests. So, uh, Titus Gable uh, is the author of Free Private Cities. He's a lawyer by education and an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, he Titus founded several successful companies. Now he has turned his focus on building value in the creation of new empowered communities, and that's why he also has uh, written this book, uh, Free Private Cities. Uh, previously, Titus founded several companies, including resources company, it's called Deutsche Rohstoff AG, for which he served as president and CEO until he retired in 2015. In that role, he directed the oil, ga gas and precious metals exploration and development projects in Europe, Australia and North America. So Titus um, holds a PhD in foreign public law and international law from the University of Heidelberg and an MBA in international management consulting. And Titus is also the uh, Tipolis, uh, the founder and CEO of Tipolis, which maybe perhaps we can talk later about that. With his extensive worldwide network, he has assembled a world-class team, uh, ensuring the highest standard of performance and measurable success uh, for prosperity zones. Um, Jeff Booth is a visionary, a tech leader, a stri strategical advisor. He is on a number of uh, advisory boards and boards of number of companies. He led the company Build Direct, a technology company that aimed to simplify the building industry uh, f and for nearly two decades throughout the dot-com meltdown, the 2008 financial crisis and many waves of technological disruption. So he's built a company which is really um, hundreds of millions of dollars market valuation. Um, he's also been featured in a number of uh, media publications and he's also the founding fellow on the Creative Destruction Lab. If I may, um, Titus, would you just um, maybe in a nutshell, so about approximately five minutes, uh, describe what is a free private city? 
and maybe also give us a short introduction in comparison distinction to the so-called, you know, uh, special economic zones or other cities that uh, have sort of a semi-autonomous but within, you know, a state uh, structure. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Thanks so much, Litus. Yeah, of course. Um, so a free private city is a system in which a private company uh, functions as a governance service provider and offers you the protection of life, liberty, and property. And this service would include internal and external security, a legal and regulatory framework, in, and independent dispute resolution. And you pay a contractually fixed uh, fee per year for these services. So it's not a tax, it's a, it's a, it's a real uh, service fee. Uh, besides that, you can take care of everything else by yourself, but that means you can also do as you please, limited only by, of course, the respective rights of others and the contractually agreed rules of coexistence. And, and this government service provider, as the private operator of the community, cannot, this is the big difference, unilaterally change this citizen's contract with you at a later date. Um, disputes between you and the operator will be heard before independent arbitration tribunals as it is customary in international commercial law. If the operator ignores the arbitrary awards or abuses his power in any other way, his customers leave and he goes bankrupt. He therefore has an own economic risk and an incentive to treat his customers well and in accordance with the contract. So. What I'm basically saying is that what we already know from our living together here in the market world, that we choose the services we want to hire or to pay or to buy, that we do the same with uh, uh, what I called in the market of living together is a, is a governance service. Um, I mean, the it was a, the, a monarch of all people, the uh, Prince Hans Adam of Liechtenstein, who said, if the state wants to survive in the 21st century, he has to develop from a demigod to a service provider and make his clients happy instead of uh, being authoritative and uh, having subjects and they have to obey. And that's, that's my point, right? I want to, to make an offer and I, I'm not going to force anybody in that offer you know what you get from me. It's in a contract. You have a real contract, not a fictional social contract. It's a real service contract. It says what you have to pay. And I'm not the guy who is then changing at will, like our states do, um, all these all these regulations uh, any year. Um, so the biggest, uh, I would say, um, difference uh, to traditional systems is that really everybody is basically sovereign of themselves um, with a contract. Um, the, the, the state service provider, if you want to name it like that, is just um, deploying the framework. Within the framework, the society can develop uh, in an open form, um, in the form of a spontaneous order, as, as Haig put it. Um, and in so far, I would say, uh, that is that is a total different system to what we have today but on the other hand it's not unknown we have we are using it already in other parts uh, of our lives what's the difference to a special economic zone i would say we would need to make this happen a much larger autonomy than the traditional special economic zone special economic zones have uh, some autonomy they have normally other tax regimes and other customs regimes maybe some labor law regime different to the host nation. But we would ask for more independence. We would rather, rather target the technically is called a special administrative region, right? Macau and Hong Kong are SAR, special administrative regions. Um, and um, in so far, this is um, in a way, it's a, it's a development of a special economic zone. It's the next level of special economic zones but it is also going much further than the special economic zone. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so bef uh, before we talk about the vision, um, um, Jeff, would you uh, maybe in a nutshell uh, um, lay out or explain, you know, uh, the essence, the core uh, theme of your book? Sure. Uh, Thank you. Um, so, so at the highest level, we have two 
two giant forces competing against each other right now, and just about everything else uh, in our lives is a is a second order, a third order effect of that. On one side, we have technological deflation moving exponential, uh, trying to bring prices down. And if you think about that concept, um, I'm sure in your own personal life, you want your the value of your money to go up and goods and services to go down in price in relation to 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 that uh, that, uh, uh, that money. That's what technology is doing. It's driving deflation. It's driving uh, price uh, prices down everywhere. Um, and against that force, um, and it's continuing across every industry um, at a rate that is it's hard to fathom. And against that force, we have essentially debt creation, money printing, monetization, trying to stop that price through those prices coming down because we've always lived in an inflationary world. Um, and if if you let deflation happen, you're, we're going to have a massive depression as, as the debt is unwound from the society. So instead of letting that happen, governments are trying to inflate at all costs. And that inflation at all costs is driving all the inequality, uh, all the riches to asset owners and picking the pockets of saver, savers and income earners. Um, the, the problem with it is because, expon because technology is moving exponentially, um, there has to be an exponential rise in debt to keep up to essentially a 2% inflation target that the Fed and other governments have. So. So it's going to end in misery, um, and you can already see the breakings of society. So the societal contract, because of this, uh, these two forces fighting each other. Fantastic! Thanks so much. So the vision after I read both of your books, I mean, I was so um, excited because I was thinking uh, the vision I've had is. Um, what if we have, you know, not one, two, three, but like so many other like uh, options, choices to go from one free private city into another where we have a monetary sound, you know, uh, monetary system, a deflationary technology uh, and concrete in concrete terms. Yes, Bitcoin, because it is the hardest, scarcest money, because it is uncensorable, censorship resistant, unconfiscatable and uh, totally decentralized. And uh, um, what if we, because I like Tito's approach and the, the themes and topics you, you both talk about, they overlap one another. And that's the beauty of it. You know, when you talk about technological innovations, uh, you know, freedom, prosperity, abundance, uh, or about evolution. There's even a chapter in Tito's book where it's called, you know, re uh, evolution instead of revolution. So uh, what I've been envisioning is that, and that's why I want to pick your brains and also maybe uh, Stephanie can also uh, uh, ask her more specific questions like, how do you envision, how, what would be the pitfalls to create that kind of society, that kind of, let's say, uh, miniaturized civilization uh, all over the world where we have, you know, a sound monetary system, we have incentives where, uh, you know, thousands of uh, Elon Musk-like types come in, uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, uh, engineers, inventors, and, you know, we have a, a, a real capitalistic free market system, real competition, as Titus also talks in his book, like through competition, you create incentives and through that process, maybe even pressurize or force other governments, nation states to adapt, to adapt to that, you know, to this new uh, paradigm shift, to this new evolutionary, you know, civilization. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, maybe if I want to uh, start off Titus, uh, what would be the pitfalls also? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is def def definitely the way we, we, where we want to go to, right? To let, let the thousand nations or societies bloom. Uh, and it's interesting then without, without knowing Jeff's book, I came basically to the same conclusion uh, uh, that um, one of the problems that we have is that currencies or interest rates can be manipulated um, and in, in a free private city, this is not the case because there's no central bank. Um, there is no, um, at least in my, my initial model, there, there's no currency that we dictate. So there's a free banking system. You can do whatever you want. 
and thereby the purchasing power of the residents because of like, technology and gains in productivity is constantly in increasing. Uh, and that, that allows for, for retirement whenever the person concerned considers the level reached to be sufficient. We had this already, I think, in the 19th century in, in the, where for a long time we had the gold standard. But what is, what is the problem of making this happen? I mean, the biggest problem for my uh, um, society is, is, of course, that uh, the world is already taken by the states, right? So there's no unclaimed land where you can just say, hey, let's establish here um, a, a free private city. And even in territories where, where there's no a, a national sovereignty, like in the Antarctica, they have international agreements that you cannot do something like that. Um, and how difficult it is on the high seas that, that have my colleagues from the Seasteading Institute um, uh, several times uh, uh, learned, and uh, it, it's not that easy. So what we have to negotiate is, a, is an agreement with the government, and, and we can only get that if we create a win-win situation. Now, you might say, okay, how does, why should they do that? Well, there, there, there are some reasons why they are letting this happen, and... I would say every special economic zone you, you had uh, in, the, in the 60s, you had maybe a handful of special economic zones in the world. Today, it's more than 4,000. So every single special economic zone is already a confession by the state that obviously his laws are not the best for at least businesses, right? So, and they know um, now that they have cornered themselves with uh, inflation and uh, more and more central planning, which is necessary to make to, to continue this system, uh, the, the re more reasonable governments will recognize that they need to create some outlets, some special zones where really money can be made. And uh, for them, it's more this aspect uh, to creating jobs and have investments. For us, this is more the freedom aspect. But we can combine both of those um, ideas. And that's basically what I'm currently doing is negotiating with governments. Um, these are not first world governments and they are not uh, the most uh, uh, super states, but that's the name of the game, right? You have to start somewhere and you say, okay, this is here, we are going into an untouched area because our concept is 100% is voluntary. Um, so we do not want to force somebody into that, but we have an area here which is formerly was undeveloped. Now we are bringing investment, development, jobs, and that might be then for you the reason to give away some of your power and give us some uh, uh, kind of autonomy. So this is the trade-off, and that is difficult. There is absolutely no, no doubt about that. Jeff, where does deflation? I mean, this is you know such a, a simplistic thing, and you've you've uh, you know repeated this uh, over and over again in your interviews. And also last time, it's like deflation is a is a gravity that that you know central banks, governments cannot fight against. So, uh, where do you see this? How can we embed this deflation, or do you see that you know sort of a, uh, as a scalable solution? If we start you know with with small sized uh, free private cities where you know not only the existing technologies but the ones that are already being developed and in in innovative process so we can embed that into the new structure uh, i mean who would mind uh, you know who would object to you know lower and lower prices while getting more and more quality and also as tito said you know you would maybe pay an annual fee of whatever one thousand dollars or, do or euros uh, as a as a service fee right and on top of that, you would get so many other additional, uh, 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 you know, uh, benefits. Um, so, and, and I'm going to say this first, uh, Titus, I love I, just idea generation that's, that's kind of challenging uh, the status quo. Um, but I do see, you've already mentioned a couple that, that, uh, that are really hard things to get this idea uh, going. And one of them, uh, one of them is, if you actually, if if you agree that deflation uh, or technology is deflationary, and it's hard to not agree with that, it's a fact. Um, nobody uses technology to make their costs go up. Um, and if you also agree that it's moving into all areas of society, then then we realize it's going to be exponentially deflationary. And Kevin, you asked this question, and so so. It, it, there's a whole bunch of uh, things you have to unpack in that. Yes, it means 
your uh, your things you're buying, services, goods are going down in price all the time, and and your time is more valued. But it also means your wages are going down over time too. It means you don't need to work for a living. You don't need to work for 60 years of your life to try to retire for the last 10 with money. That all you've done is tried to put enough money away so you could retire um, um, safe, safely. So most of our time is going in to try to collect enough st- stuff so that we can enjoy our time. And this inverts that equation. In addition to all of that, so, so how do you price that city? In addition to all that, um, you have, okay, let's say, let's say uh, you had this area. Um, and, and one of the key tenants is it pro- provides protection for residents. How does it pro- provide protection in a world that is completely breaking because of either civil war or wars, because of uh, because of uh, because governments are fighting technology deflation with uh, with printing money, and that's going to break society. So it's going to be hard to protect that that let's call it a, if everything else worked that oasis so protecting that oasis would mean spending way more on robots military anything else to protect that oasis so then you get into the same game theory that governments get into right you get into the cost goes up to protect um to be able to and, and so so if you have a small oasis um, you can't leverage that across the society um, enough to, to even protect it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things in, in that, um, and I'd love to hear Tito's, but, but, but just because of game theory, just because of what is bound to happen as a next step that make that a really difficult under, uh, undertaking because, uh, because of all the other things that are going to happen in conjunction with uh, with deflation taking hold and and here's the thing that i we will probably get so right now uh, if you add more debt to society um there's an assumption that that debt has to be paid back and so so that assumption means the debt itself is more disinflationary right because you're taking from today you're spending today and you have to pay that back with dollars tomorrow so so today we actually have more deflation, more disinflation um, coming, technology becoming a bigger contributor and all of the debt has to be paid back. I fully expect that the governments to change the rules as Tito's does, um, to change the rules, to say the debt doesn't have to be paid back and do direct injection into whether it's MMT or whatever, to be able to do direct injection into people's hands. At which time, fiat currency starts to get destroyed, you move to hyperinflation, wealth is completely wiped out, and then you move back to deflation. So that's what I would expect to happen over the over the next, call it, five to 10 years. Yeah, with the exception that wealth is not completely wiped out uh, as long as you have assets which are still valued, right? I mean, we have, we have seen several hyperinflations. And if you know it in advance, you can at least um, survive it without losing everything, and that's all. And, and, and just in that piece, Titus, and, and effectively that piece is what governments rally around, and and the people come with pitchforks to take the wealth back, right? That's what you're seeing right now, and uh, and so the, if you look at in the 30s, if you look at Hitler's rise to power, who did he pick on? Right, picked on the asset owners. And, uh, and because because it's easy to turn a population that has nothing to against a, a population a smaller population that has everything. But I agree with you. That's in fact why housing prices are up, why gold prices are up, why 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 assets are up. Why um, is the more you print, you just drive those assets. Yeah, and I, I would I would agree that for certain assets you are much more endangered than for others, right? We, we, I mean, we have seen this, right? In the uh, and the, the high in superinflation in in uh, the Weimar Republic in Germany after World War One, um, then uh, they had uh, um, a special uh, mortgage afterwards on the on the landowners, right? To uh, 
for, for solidarity reasons. And the same happened again after World War II. So if you have, we own a house, then probably <laughs> um, uh, they will come after you. But I mean, this is also another case for Bitcoin, for example, right? So it's, it's, it's much harder to get after Bitcoin owners, especially if they, are, they already have left the country. Um, but here's my point. I mean, I don't see it um, that negatively. Why not? Because thank God we do not have a world government. We have a world that is comprising of about 200 countries, a lot of uh, autonomous areas or semi-autonomous areas, um, a lot of decentralized on some decentralized countries like Switzerland, where it is not possible to impose all that at once on all countries. So there will always be niche. There will always be countries who are happy if other countries fail and um, they are not supportive of uh, other countries' governments if they're going after their, their high potentials. But in, uh, to the opposite, they will, they will offer those high potentials maybe a safe haven. So there will be, there will be enough options, I think, to escape the worst. Um, but that is also one of the reasons why I'm coming up with this free private city concept at all. Um, that you have something as an alternative to uh, democratic socialism, right? Because that's the only thing people know. It's a one or the other form of socialism. That's the only alternative they can think about. And in so far, it's good that we have maybe a market liberty oriented um, option, which is, by the way, completely voluntary. So we can always say to people, hey, have a look. Um, that happened in the past. We had an extremely wealthy city of Venice, which was always talked bad about because the, the neighboring countries were, were jealous. But uh, it's also the effect that they still had something, some bon a bonus, some benefits from Venice being Venice, and so they didn't destroy it. And that is also why Hong Kong survived so relatively long after the British gave it back, was 1997. I mean, the, the Chinese could have occupied the country the day after the British gave it over. And that didn't happen because China still thought, oh, there's something in it for us. And maybe we have, a, we have more advantage of such small entities uh, being beat as a safe haven for our own money. Um, and... Um, and to having access to international capital. Something in that region, I think, is working towards us. So it's a combination. It's uh, one, uh, even if the country politically, officially, totally dislikes what we do, then they might still find uh, in real politics that we have some benefit to them. And on the other hand, I think, given the turmoil that is coming, and I, I agree with your assessment, Jeff, I think many, many countries will have really other problems than go after free private city in some parts of the world. So um, the more civil war like these things are, um, the less people have, uh, have the time to go after something that they dislike. But unlike me, I'm 100% in favor of making free private cities happen. These people are against free private cities, but not 100% because they have so many other things to do, right? And that is our chance. Right. So, so when, when you're talking about, by the way, I told, we don't have uh, a free market anymore. So I agree with you that the, um, the more printing, the more government intervention, it, more, it looks more and more like socialism. And, and nobody's asking where that money comes from. And so... So if you if you say what if you look at what's happening instead of um, in your in, in your world in your example somebody pays a service fee you could call that a tax right um, and, and and so governments tax to be able to pay their service fees um, and and so in that same example you could call that a tax inflation is a hidden tax. Right? That's all it is. It's picking the pocket of a whole bunch of people and allowing governments to spend more than they could through through an inflationary monetary policy that is hidden to most people because most people don't realize their real wages are going down. That's what, and, and so, so inflation is just a tax on society that allows governments to overspend. Um, so in your, in, 
that's I, it, so when I kind of and remember I'm not deep into your, your thesis, I haven't read the book yet but when I see that uh, when I when I say okay how could an autonomous zone working on a different currency so let's say let's say one region decided okay we're going to not we're gonna in, unless it was unless you had something like bitcoin that was the monetary that was uh, was a global phenomenon which i think is going to happen um how um how could one city have a different um monetary policy and what i mean by that is that region would still have to buy and sell from other people and so if if other regions essentially destroyed their currency value what it means is their labor rates go down in relation to a country or a region that doesn't destroy their currency value and if you have to trade with other regions and even in technology you have to use other region services and elon musk doesn't build rockets and and, and, and cars without global trade it means you have to have a unit of measure globally to be able to make that work so, so I suspect what's going to happen here, and there's there's probably something in your your idea, but I suspect what's going to happen here is the game theory, specifically with Bitcoin alone, um, and and the the incentive structure and um, that makes governments, the early governments that use that that move to Bitcoin, gives them more power, and allows for. Um, you, you use the example of Weimar Republic before. I think a lot of the reason why people don't didn't, even though they saw it coming, they didn't move up from uh, from Germany at that time. And there's lots of historical precedent for this, is because all their, of their wealth was in Germany, and they couldn't move it easy, housing everything else, and so it's really hard to move with nothing. Bitcoin changes that. In Bitcoin, you can move anywhere with it, with anything. So governments that adopt Bitcoin early will have a massive advantage, um, and they will. Uh, um, and if there's rule of law, if there's other things that make uh, that that drive their economy, they'll be able to pick up the brightest brightest people, the people uh, with access to to money or Bitcoin, um, faster as a result of that, and people be able to move uh, move to regions. So. So I think what you're, you're doing has kind of merit, but but I still think it'll be controlled at a government level, and it'll be it'll be done as, at a government that, and maybe it's using a kind of a model that you're describing as a as a as a start to it, but I think it'll be done at a government level. Yeah, my my idea about currency was because a lot of people are coming saying, "Hey, do you do an own token cryptocurrency or whatever?" And I said, "No." I let the market decide. The only thing I really have to fix is in what currency these people pay me, right, as an operator. So why do I do I not use the, the word tax? Because in, um, in legal theory, a tax is something that you have to pay, but you do not have a claim in exchange or a specified claim in exchange. Whereas a service fee, uh, for example, in my case, I owe you protection of life, liberty, and property, and therefore you pay. And if you are robbed, uh, you say, hey, sorry, I paid for security, now, now I'm robbed, I want damages, right? Or I keep my next payment back. And that is not possible with taxes. And so far, I think it's, I fully agree that deflation is a hidden tax. But in so far, this is just to get to make it clear that you have more rights than a taxpayer uh, as, a, as a contract citizen. But I'm not telling you what currency to use. That means you can basically make your businesses with either with fiat money or with Bitcoin or with whatever regional currency is around the free private city or Swiss francs. Um, the only thing I would say is, look, um, I want you to pay 1000 euro uh, per year as the, as the fee for, for my services. And I have a clause that says in case I can switch to gold, right, which was the exchange rate gold to euro at the point at the day you you ex, you sign the contract um, because that is because i know that eventually uh the euro uh, maybe the euro even earlier and the dollar will collapse 
So that is my my. I would use gold as a as a back uh, fallback solution. Why? Because Bitcoin is too volatile yet, and uh, and in so far that is that is all right. So I say uh, whatever else is happening in society. Um, might then be subject to the people's wish. And uh, some people might say, hey, we are only doing transactions in, in Bitcoin. Other people, probably business people will, will accept all kinds of currencies. And of course you have the, uh, if you are working on a basis that you have uh, non-inflationary uh, currency, then your wages will be disproportionately high, right? And you have to make it up with productivity. That's always has been the problem of Switzerland. But it has, they have found ways to do that. They have basically exactly discovered what, what you are saying, Jeff, that they, uh, they um, have to just uh, use technology and then they can produce more in, in shorter time and make up for this uh, disadvantage that the others have uh, lower and lower salaries compared to the Swiss guys. And uh, we will probably see something comparable in, in free private cities, but I'm... I'm I'm not in favor of forcing a certain currency, even if it's Bitcoin, uh, to be used by all the inhabitants. But, but just just play on exactly what you just said. So so let's say let's say you do this in Turkey, and and, and the Turkish lira is running away right now right, um, and losing value, and all the residents there are from Turkey, or a bunch of the residents are from Turkey. And, and in other words, their purchasing power is getting destroyed right now. Um, and you have to provide protection of this, uh, of this. And, um, and, and you have to buy goods from around the world that now cost more. Um, what do you do? So, so your rates just for this population just went way up and they can't pay it. That's kind of what I'm getting at. It, it, it doesn't work. Um, yep. unless, and, and, if you, and if you and if you change to if you change to gold and they can't pay it, it doesn't change it. Yeah, but we would not uh, probably uh, all deal with Turkish lira within the free private city, right? Probably exactly because the Turkish lira is such a, uh, a weak currency, uh, people would have switched to the euro instead or whatever uh, other currency, and then the people living in the city would not get their their payment in Turkish lira they would get but, guess, but if you if you just play that forward and that's where I'm getting at if you play that forward the same thing is going to happen to the euro the same thing is going it's just a matter of time yeah um, but it will always be a more stable currency and that is what we would probably not do, our market participants in the city would would choose um and um you can see it always coming, right? It's it's not that it's happening overnight. So the the I don't see the problem that the market cannot adapt to that. I would even say a free private city in Turkey would definitely avoid the Turkish lira, and all the Turkish people living in the city would do the same. They would buy on purpose, not not do business on Turkish lira for that very reason. And even if the euro is getting weaker, then they switch to the next best currency. That's what usually happens, right? And you. I mean, you have seen this before. Hong Kong had an own currency, Hong Kong dollar, which was uh, completely different to the Chinese currency. And that obviously does work. Singapore has an own currency. So uh, if people think it's a, the best idea of the world is to make an own currency, I would rather say that some cryptocurrency then is just by market demand will prove to be uh, valid. And this one will then be used uh, automatically, more or less. And, and so that's what I think is going to happen, but I think it's going to happen to, at, a, at a level that's higher than the level that you're, you're talking about. I think it's going to happen on Bitcoin. Um, at, at, so, so because that currency and that there's, a, there's already a network effect gaining on that currency, it, it is still small, but, it, it, but because of the network effect on, on currency, it creates game theory. Um, and if, even if some governments try to ban it, if people can move their uh, move easily to other countries and so so because of the need for governments to find ways to tax and pay for services and they're going to be forced to tax and pay for services through savings through choice right rather than through because otherwise the currencies are going to collapse this is going to happen and this is going to happen fast way faster than people re realize 
um, deflation is coming no matter what, right? If, if you go, if you follow the technology uh, trend, so 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 we are going to we are going to live in a savings culture, um, and 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 our dollars are going to be worth more, whether it's Bitcoin or if it's going. I suspect it's going to be Bitcoin, but it creates such an incentive for governments to move there faster at that level um, to be able to, to bring in enough wealth. So you're, it, 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 I'm going to backtrack special economic zones, including Hong Kong, Singapore and everything else are set up exactly that way to attract more money, to attract more capital so that, uh, so, so that the government has more revenues. That's why they're designed. Right. And, and what I'm getting at is, when governments are forced to to play by rules that aren't inflationary, they're going to be forced. Otherwise, their currencies are going to break. Um, they're also going to be forced to. The next step of that is to try to set up um, areas that encourage people with Bitcoin and everything else to move there. Yeah, and we could be such an area, right? I mean, you. It's not need, needed to to coin it a free private city. You can say it's a Bitcoin special zone or prosperity zone or whatever. And I just, uh, yeah, I just think if you did that, if you did that with governments, um, you would have you would have far more um, take up because 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 it's not a that currency is going I think governments are going to peg to that that currency over time. And that's going to that is going to I think that's going to be the driver of this change. So uh, maybe bringing everything a little bit together, what we were discussing right now, I really like that you were mentioning, Titus, that when there's like chaos and kind of a civil war everywhere, people will have other problems than going after a free private city. And then we were talking about the collapse of the fiat system. So I was thinking when we have this moment, this could be actually the point in time um, where Bitcoin also appreciates and where you can buy a real estate or a place where you can build a free private city with your Bitcoins. So I think when we, we have this crash of the fiat system, this is the point in time when you can really go after this idea of free private cities. So what do you think on that? Yeah, that is that is certainly uh, an option, right? I mean, one of the one of the reasons why I wrote my book was the experience I've made when um, I was in my early 20s when the GDR, East Germany, collapsed. And, and the only thing these people, uh, the opposition and the establishment were then sitting together, they called it the round tables. That was, a, that was about a time of a year where everybody knew that the GDR would collapse, that the, the old system would collapse. And it wasn't yet the new system. In this case, they just um, uh, unified with, with West Germany. But there was a year where people were just uh, openly discussing new ways. And the only thing they could uh, discuss is how may, do we make socialism more democratic, right? And I said, okay, at the next collapse, I think I should offer something else. Um, so that people have the idea. And I agree with you, Stephanie, that, that this could be at the time where, uh, where, and I would even say there is an opportunity coming, and then there will be a window of opportunity, which is open for maybe only two years or something like that, and then you have to make it happen. And that's what we are working on. And, of course, Bitcoin, that you have seen this in, uh, in Zimbabwe and Venezuela, the moment an official currency is collapsing, the Bitcoin is really in demand. So we probably this is going to happen again uh, in a, on a far larger scale. Um, and, and we have to be prepared for that time. And um, on the other hand, I would say it can be longer than we think that currencies collapse. They are not collapsing all at the same time. And uh, nowadays they are printing everything. They can just make, hey, let's make a new currency and uh, just make, coin it differently, but it's the same problem. But people will still believe for the next 10 years that this is now a very stable currency. So I'm not so sure that this is all coming so quickly, but it can come quickly and we have to be prepared. And um, yes, I agree that that would be then the time where establishing a free private city would be much easier than it is now. Yeah, thank you so much, Titus. That was really eye-opening. <laughs>
Yeah, and let me just make it one point here. I mean, um, um, you know, the mainstream talks about Bitcoin as a speculative asset, but you know, it's it, it is it, it is what is this? Uh, it's in its evolutionary phase of store of value. What if, what if you know, by exponential speed, Bitcoin could not only become store of value, you know, safe haven or whatever, or inflation hedge, but also as a you know, the next phases of medium of exchange, unit account, settlement layer, and then on top of that, if you have the Lightning Network. And then you are also totally independent, like we are right now from the internet, uh, which we have some issues with right now. Uh, I mean, it's already possible to send Bitcoin transaction by satellite and, and then furthermore uh, through radio transmission signals. I'm just trying to make the point like, what if right now we can, you know, in the very near future, we can make, we are totally independent of any governmental central banking monetary system. So the central bank system is then obsolete when you have all these phases you know, uh, embedded into, uh, I don't know, a number, uh, infinite number of, of free private cities around the world. Yeah, um, that is, I mean, certainly something where a lot of people were, were thinking about. And I was, I was always somebody who said it's not enough to have this virtual independence because they come after you, they arrest you, right? <laughs> they say, okay, give us your Bitcoin or you will stay in prison. So you also need to have physically safe havens that that's also why why we need free private cities and it, it it's indeed the idea is not to have one free private city but to have a uh like the hanseatic league right a, a, a more or less uh conglomerate of different cities of different places which uh, support each other and uh you can call them startup societies or whatever you want um, but this is this is certainly something that will happen, especially in a very instable future. Um, this is the smallest entity that can, uh, or at least in the, in the, in the last two thousand years, that, that that is viable is is a community or a city that it, it can defend itself, it can create order, order and chaos very quickly, and and that can happen again. And uh, the, the idea is that we basically deploy today all the mechanisms. Um, you were mentioning Bitcoin as, as a cornerstone, as a potential cornerstone. That is fine. But also we have to have a kind of a citizen's contract as a blueprint so that others can copy it. We have to have an agreement with the government of the host nation, which at that difficult times in the future may not even have the power to uh, rule outside their capital, but we would still have a contract, right? Because there will be other times and then you can say, hey, this is all based on uh, contractual agreement. And, and all these things or how you master plan for the city's core or something like that, you will have a lot of um, market-based urban order, but you will also have a kind of a basis infrastructure. So all this is currently designed. That's what I'm working on with my partners at the moment. So that you in the future, and every human being in the future can say, hey, what about this free private city concept? Can we, happen? Can we make it happen here? We need only 1,000 people. Everything is already there. We copy this. And maybe we, we adapt it to our regional specifics. That is the idea, indeed. Yeah, and, and Kevin, if you, if you kind of go back on that, if you just say, to, so whether Bitcoin, and I agree with you where Bitcoin is going, by the way, but but it's not enough that that a monetary system is, is like Bitcoin um, is is it, it, um, it, that people have it and can go to cloud and everything else. So is that it's world trade needs to happen in Bitcoin. It needs to be a settled settled in Bitcoin instead of U.S. dollars or instead of the yuan or instead of um, the euro. Because if you understand what's ha happening. Every time the government, so right right now, by the way, and Tito and I agree on this. I actually don't think the U.S. I think the U.S. dollar is actually going to get stronger before it, before it gets weaker, and I, it's weak right now. A lot of people calling for the demise right now. I think it's going to go on for a lot because it's actually the strongest currency in a basket of very weak ones. Yeah. Um, and what happens is they print money, <clears throat> their labor rate goes down, right, and they become more competitive. And other governments are forced to print money at that rate to keep the exchange, uh, exchange rates of world trade. And that's why tariffs are coming. 
um, all over, and you have all the tariffs trying to stop that problem of monetary easing all, all over. So it's just all so broken because we don't have a unit of measure that I can buy from you from somewhere around the world and trust that you're not going to destroy your pay me back in different a different currency or different currency value. That's the problem, and it takes world trade to be able to manage whether it's a city of a thousand or anything else because you can't satisfy unless unless everything was in that city which means the costs go way up for that city you can't satisfy um everything that's needed for a city with a thousand people it's impossible so so that's that's why a unit of measure is so important and i and 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 that's also why bitcoin and and and, and why i suspect that this is like if you just zoom up a level titus and say the same thing is at play right now but it's a play at a very bigger level we all have choices of where we many of us have choices of where we want to live uh, portugal for instance right now um for uh for three hundred fifty thousand, i can get a golden visa and i can move to uh, and and that just an investment where i get a return on that um and i i can move to portugal move my family to portugal there's there's a whole and, and those numbers in different countries are coming down everywhere as people are countries are desperate for more taxpayers and people that are, can pay the bills that's what's happening right now at a governmental level i suspect that that's going to continue and i suspect that that's going to continue at a, at a rate but it's going to be done at because whether it's a free private city, you're just talking about a unit of measure that is sorry, a, a smaller number. I think it's just going to happen at a government level and we're going to have choices of where we live. And those rules are going to be very clear because they have to be very clear if you're denominated in Bitcoin. And otherwise you'll move because it's easy to move. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure if these rules have to be they have to be clear as long as these governments have problems. And the moment they are stabilizing, they will change the rules to your disadvantage. And, and that's kind of the point, but on Bitcoin, because it's so, it, because it's transportable, it's, it's so easy to move. Um, then, then the competition for, uh, for capital, labor and capital is, or, or intelligence, uh, labor and ca capital is so great that they're going to be forced to change the rules to attract that. Yeah, hopefully. And uh, it should happen like that, but it can also go in the other way that there will be all kinds of repression and uh, um, in order to solve that problem, which can't be solved, right? And there will be another group that will go into gold instead of Bitcoin. And there are already some gold related payment systems out there. So where you don't have to own the gold uh, physically that you that you uh, have it in your pocket, but you own it in a vault in Switzerland, or just an example as one one payment system based on that. So I think the market is already looking for for what you are um, uh, saying, Jeff. And my my main point is that um, I think not only the monetary system is is completely. Um, based on, on wrong assumptions or on a not functioning technicality. I, I also see our systems uh, having the same problems because uh, they are based on the idea that there is a group of people who can make all decisions about your life and it's called making laws. And they can, they, they claim it's a rule of law, but what is the rule of law worth if you can change the laws any day at will? And you can just in, even change the constitution. So there is no protection uh, in a world where uh, people think, okay, we make the decisions and you have to obey. That is not a world that can function. Even if I admit that through the monetary pressure you are describing correctly, um, states somehow have have to behave in a way, but we had this in the past. Um, normally after big crisis, there are reasonable guys in the government and politicians, reasonable people making reasonable rules. The moment a certain uh, 
wealth has been created in societies, then the good bodies come into power, the redistributioners, because there will be a big group of people, um, especially in a world where you don't have to, to work uh, all day long, which have nothing to do, but they have uh, full voting rights. And what happening is that they say we are entitled to everything because it's our human right to have a house. It's our human right to have work. It's our human right to have free healthcare, free education and a car. So there's a complete misunderstanding because you cannot have a right without somebody else having a respective obligation. And the, the, the basic universal income is just a contemporary example for that. There are people out there who think they have the right of an universal income, totally forgetting that you can only make this happen if somebody has to be forced to work for your universal basic income. In other circumstances, this is called slavery, right? And as long as people have not understood this fact, we will get a lot of problems with or without Bitcoin. And that is why we need free private cities um, as a safe haven for people who have recognized that, that you should basically not demand from others what you know are you are not willing to give and you should do no harm to others if you don't want them to do harm to you. So it's a, it's a strict reciprocal system which we are trying to establish. Um, and that is not sustainable in a, in a system where everybody um, can vote uh, the neighbor's money into his own pocket. That's the problem I also want to address. And again, I'm I hear what you're saying, but I'm not sure that this is, can be solved by monetary measures, uh, by monetary ideas only. So, that, so by the way, that is what, exactly why, why I like Bitcoin so much. And, and I didn't come to Bitcoin from uh, seeing Bitcoin and then coming the other way. I knew about it, obviously, but yeah, I came the other way saying game theory, economics, monetary policy, uh, what entrepreneurs do, how to, uh, um, and and came to down the Bitcoin rabbit hole this way, and I can't think of anything else as, uh, that's more important to be able to as a driving function, because I actually some of the what you just said, I totally agree with you. There's a whole bunch of people right now that believe in MMT and and um, and, and essentially socialism. We give you free money without asking where does that money come from. Um, and, but it, it's, it's understandable if you're them and, um, and you can't pay your bills, um, and the only, and, and there's been, and your pockets have been picked for 80 years, um, why you would think that that would be a good idea. So I understand, I, I can disagree with, uh, disagree with whether it'll work or not but understand the, and have empathy to why people like it and see and get something for nothing. The, the bigger issue, the bigger issue is, is it's, you, you said it. Um, if I control money supply, I control everything else, right? If I control the money, um, I control the courts. I control everything else. I would rather have the money printing machine than just about anything else. And the money printing machine is the problem. It is, and every government has their money printing machine, and people aren't seeing what's actually happening to them. They're getting uh, the, the the amount of uh, the, the amount of polarization in society today because of the money printing machines um, is so staggering, and because and people are e easy to say it's not it's it's not my fault, it's that person's fault over there, and it's all caused by the money printing machines. And and if I control the if I control the money, I essentially control who's who has the money, who's going to be elected into the court system, and everything else. So that's um, I, and and without getting political on on this, just factual. Um, if you look at two thousand and eight, right? And two thousand eight, we should have had a depression. Instead, the same architects of the crisis got bailed out. So if you had if you had real estate, housing, everything else at that time. And, and you didn't print money like you, like they did. 
then that would have collapsed and that completely collapsed in value as would, and the debt would have been, how it would, everybody that owned it would have, not everybody, but many would have gone bankrupt, including Donald Trump, right? Instead, all of those, all of those people made out uh, like bandits and, and you, you prevented the free market from happening. And so all of the wealth accumulated faster to the same architects of the crisis instead of getting wiped out. Um, and, 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 and it picked the pockets of a whole bunch of society that were, let's say, people saving for real estate at that same time. As you did that, you destroyed the currency value um, and those savings became worthless or, or worth less money than before and made it harder to get real estate. And then, and then Trump is elected as the president because he's a great business person, right? And, and it's, it, it's all because of this, this uh, monetary easing and, and, and policy of controlling money. That is, that it, those are the rules that are being changed all the time. And the byproducts, the, the secondary and third order, second and third order effects are, to our society are staggering. Yeah, but the question is, what is the chicken and what is the egg, right? I think that people demand the printing press and uh, politicians are, politicians want to stay in power. They are not interested in monetary theories. And they, they see that, okay, if I raise taxes, then I'm not popular. But if I do it through the printing press, it will not be discovered. So, and I can fulfill all the demands that people have. Now, exactly, exactly. Now, okay, exactly. Now, 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 okay, it's good that we agree on that. Now imagine we have, a, we have an election. You are the candidate saying, okay, we have to be, uh, to, to put everything on Bitcoin because this will, is the only cure to all the big problems we have. And the other uh, person would say, hey, no, that's, uh, that's not true. We just, uh, I'm following the new monetary theory. We just print a lot of money and you will get a, a basic free income of $1,000 per month. So what do you think people would vote for, right? Normally they vote for me because that's, I would say evolutionary. I call it the minimal principle or it's, it's generally called that. You don't, you want to get the biggest uh, result for the least effort. And that is the problem that the monopoly of power of, of policy can address that by just uh, putting on the printing press or in former times when they hadn't discovered that mechanism yet, they were just expropriating the rich, like the uh, like, uh, or would say they are witches or whatever. There will be all kinds of, of reasons to get money and distribute it uh, amongst the people who you want to follow. And I think this might happen again, even if we have now the big uh, downfall of fiat currencies and, and Bitcoin will be there for a while and will be universally accepted. Then some areas would come up with this idea, hey, Bitcoin, we cannot influence it. We should have our own currency. And these people will get elected. And then you start anew. That is my concern. And um, in so far, I think um, uh, we should have more mechanisms to counter that than just um, putting in a new currency or, or, I mean, we cannot do much. We can just uh, promote or so you saying this, it's happened automatically. And I tend to agree with that. But after that, it's also happening automatically that people get trying to get to trick them around this problem. And even if a politician might know that this will fail in the next 20 years again, that's long enough. That's By the way, we, we, we totally agree on, on that. Here's the, here's the difference. Here's the difference. And I think that this is the um, very rarely does an existing system change itself. Um, it takes revolution uh, for an existing system to change itself and then new rules are set. Um, or, or Kodak, even though they invent the, tech, uh, the, the digital camera, doesn't exploit the digital camera. We use more, we use more photos today than we ever did. And, and Kodak missed that whole thing. Or Netflix doesn't, or sort of Blockbuster doesn't create Netflix. Very often, the change comes from outside because the existing incumbent to, to society is too wrapped up in how to create, to hold on to power their way. And they drive power right off a cliff by doing so. 
that's what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is is an escape valve for that ha- happening, and that's why and and that game theory of why that new system is emerging, and early governments that adopt it become massive winners, is the same reason why it it, it moves so fast. Not a new currency because a new currency, a new fiat currency without uh, rules that can be tied back to everything else doesn't change anything. It just keeps extending the game. But what you're getting is a whole bunch, and it's so early, maybe Bitcoin isn't it, I will say there's there's a number, but, but where it is right now and how fast it's being adopted by now, uh, now institutions and, and other, um, the next level of this is likely governments. Um, and, and so, so just like, just like creative destruction happens in any business, I suspect this is going to, uh, the, the way that, uh, the way that fiat currency works, the way that go- governments use that inflationary policy, it's going to be destroyed by essentially a new model that is a, a better model for society. Great, thank you both so much. So um, many in the Bitcoin scene are really enthusiastic about the idea of free private cities in the form of a Bitcoin citadel eventually. So what, what I would like to ask you, what can each and every one of us do to make this vision happen? I think first and foremost, and the easiest thing is spread the idea, right? Spread, but in this case, spread both both ideas about uh, uh, Bitcoin as a deflationary currency and the free private city as a as an alternative to existing systems. And I do not see why free private cities um, uh, shouldn't make use of that uh, uh, mechanism that Jeff has outlined. So spread the idea. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm I'm the same. I, and to, uh, Titus, I, so some of your ideas here—that's why I said in, in the beginning. They, I just I really I, I I commend you for for kind of the ideation here and and do, um, I, what I actually think should be happening is you should be working at a higher level in, in government, and um and trying to to get early governments that are understanding this, um to. I I, uh, you, I believe your work should be focused at that level, or or if it's not the government of the day, the new government that's coming in to understand the power of what's coming, um, and and move it at a national level rather than a regional level. But uh, but 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 um, but yeah, I I, I agree. I think it, this is coming anyways. Currencies might hold on for longer than uh, if currencies hold on though for longer than we think, the the inequality will rise in lockstep and and what our societies will look like will not look they won't resemble what they look like today so 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 and until they break and then when they break it's going to be uh it, all hell is going to break loose All right, thank you so much. So um, we are close to the end. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners? Yeah, if you're interested in that topic, just uh, visit the website. It's freeprivatecities.com. And then there's also a a newsletter which is coming about quarterly uh, discussing the the, the current projects. You know that I'm not the only one working on, on things like free private cities. There are other people working on charter cities, seasteadings, uh, seasteads, um, uh, prosperity zones. And so we are um, telling those stories. And if you find, hey, this is something near me and I want to check this out, and we have a lot of people from the Bitcoin and crypto community, um, then you're just informed firsthand um, if we can make it happen. But at the moment, I would say it's going to happen. It's, it's only a question of time. We have really made progress in the last two or three years. And, and, for, and for me, uh, my day job is actually a, 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 with technology companies. So the book was really just a, a passion of, of, of mine, but people could follow me on at Jeff Booth on Twitter if they wanted. All right, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, K1 has internet problems. This is why he cannot end the session. 
But uh, yeah, I send you his warm greetings and really thank you so much for coming. It was an amazing episode. And yeah, um, keep up the great work. Thanks, and it's really nice to meet you. Thank you, Jeff, likewise. And thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Kevin. There you are again. Uh, it was an interesting talk. And uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, thank you so much. I really fulfilled my mission. I think I just wanted to bring it together. Unfortunately, my internet connection, or I don't know, there's thunderstorm and rain outside <laughs> right now. So I don't know what's going on, but of all the days, it's today. Anyway, um, thank you so much again. I really, it was a fantastic talk. I'm going to listen, re listen to it later on, but uh, hope we got it all recorded and, yeah, and live streamed. Thanks. Yeah, I hope we can we'll repeat this maybe in person next time. <laughs> All right. So thank, thank you so much again, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. See ya. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. How'd you like it? I had a pretty much chaos during the whole conversation because I, I dropped on and off, but thankfully I live streamed the whole thing. So it's all recorded. I downloaded the whole video. So anyway, without you know any technical details, there was thunder, rain, storm. I don't know what the fuck was going on. And um, I'm, I have to, you know, uh, re-listen to this whole interview again and again because I missed, uh, you know, a bunch of bunch of it uh, during during uh, you know the, the whole conversation. So uh, yeah, please um, like it, retweet it, share it. Let me know your your, your feedback, your questions. Please uh, subscribe to my channel and uh, yeah, follow Titus Gable and Jeff Booth on 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 Twitter, and you know read their books. It's really must read books. Uh, also websites of I'm gonna put that in the show notes of Jeff Booth and Titus Gable. Thanks so much again to my co-host, co-moderator Stephanie von Ugan. It was definitely whatever I was able to listen to during the conversation. It was a mind-blowing, really, conversation. And uh, yeah, hope to, you know, uh, let me know if you have any wish or desires or, or suggestions for any future talks. But this is the way to go. You know, it's time for evolution instead of revolution. We have got no time for revolution. It's really time for evolution. And now we have the structural things in place. And this is where we're going. We're going right now you know into exponential uh, technological monetary economical evolution thanks so much again and talk to you soon